So hello again. Uh, this is the sixth and last presentation in this series about geropalliative medicine. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. And in fact, if you made it this far, you're going to level two. And we're going to put it all together and see if you can use some of the tools we've uh, developed uh, to improve your skills in managing the advanced elderly. So where did this title come from? And I have to tell you that about 15 years ago, I was working in a nursing home and it was one of the last patients I took care of before I moved on to become um, a hospice and palliative uh, CMO. And I was talking to the son of one of my patients uh, and I'd heard this phrase a million times. And he looked at me as I was explaining to you what happened, to him what happened. He said, why didn't anybody warn us? If only somebody had warned us, I am absolutely certain my father would have never accepted the treatment that was offered to him. And so I'm going to move forward in showing you how you can use your professional skills to anticipate care at a higher level and keep your patients out of harm's way. So again, I have uh, several disclosures. This is a cardiac case study, and I want you to think about something too before we start. How would you or your system manage this patient? And would you be happy, uh, would this patient's family actually have been happier had they just ignored your system? Take the patient inside, put his feet up, give him some fluid, and maybe called you in a few days as a primary care physician instead of doing what actually happened to this patient, which was they took him to the emergency room. So this is a cardiac case study. Uh, I can tell you now, I, I changed a little bit of the numbers because I didn't want to violate any privacy issues, but this was actually a 92-year-old male. So just a few little changes there. Anyways, this is a 86-year-old female comes to see you after passing out, picking something up off the ground um, while walking her poodle, basically uh, walking, uh, cleaning up after her dog, which I always appreciate. Um, she has stable angina and was developing a little bit of exertional angina. Uh, she's occasionally lightheaded. She has known aortic stenosis. Uh, now with dyspnea walking across the room with the cane um, and ankle edema, has a front wheel walker but never uses it. Not like we ever see that. Uh, feels generally more fatigued, weaker, and has lost about 12 pounds in the last year. That was, uh, workup was unremarkable. She's had a change in appetite. We see that in our patients. Um, denies palpitations, and you can see her cardiac and medical history. She's been treated for gout, moderate arthritis, pain and depression. She has a BMI of 21. She's just generally inactive and rarely gets out because she's just, quote, not up to it. She states she hasn't had the energy she used to for years, and she does not smoke or drink. Uh, she's now living with a daughter and son-in-law for two years. Both work. Uh, she doesn't drive, cook, or pay bills. She's mildly demented with an MMSE of 22, done about uh, six months ago. Uh, her family states she's just a little bit forgetful. Of course, many families don't want us to use the word dementia, even though that's the proper diagnosis. Uh, she wears glasses and hearing aids uh, when she remembers to. She doesn't usually put them on. And the daughter states she needs help more since she's losing her strength. She's had a hysterectomy, a cholecystectomy, and she had a hip fracture recently with the stage three heel ulcer that resolved in delirium. This is the patient's medication list. Now we never see medication lists like this, do we? But the problem is that every single disease has its own set of medications. And so patients do live, uh, end up on multiple medications. And polypharmacy is a significant problem that we see in our elderly population. So these are the patient's vital signs. Patient's alert and oriented, easily distracted, no JVD at 90 degrees. The heart's irregular, two over six systolic ejection murmur. Lungs are clear with diminished breath, uh, excuse me, diminished air exchange, abdomen soft, normal bowel sounds, no hepatojugular reflex, um, no focal neurologic deficit. Um, there is plus one bilateral ankle edema and lower extremity edema. Uh, chest X-ray is poor inspiration, but no evidence of disease. Echo shows moderately severe aortic stenosis, diastolic failure, and mild decrease in left ventricular function. She has uh, EKG with AFib and a heart rate of 54. These are her abnormal laboratories. Hemoglobin slightly low, 
her cholesterol has dropped, her LDL has dropped, her pro-BNP is rising, her albumin is 3.3, those are her electrolytes, and her hemoglobin A1C is 6.0. So you see this patient, or you get a call, or the patient's in the emergency room, what's the plan of care for this patient? What would your system do? Patient has a syncopal episode, they're passing out, they passed out, um, and I can tell you, unfortunately, that this patient had a syncopal episode. They called our nurse connection. Our protocol say that send that patient to the emergency room immediately, which is where the patient went. And it's not that the patient went to the ER. That's the problem. It's that we're not perfect yet on knowing how to manage geriatric patients. I am happy that at Sharp we're developing geriatric ER so we can do a better job. But this patient was just thrown in the mix and received the usual protocol. In fact, this patient uh, was seen by the ER doctor. They consulted a cardiologist and they said, well, we need to get an angiogram before we consider surgery because we already know this patient has moderately severe aortic stenosis and their angina is a little bit worse. However, if this patient had gotten a palliative consultation or a primary care physician trained in palliative skills, here's some of the questions that we need to be asking. Where in the bell curve does this patient exist? And you've seen this already. When I was trained as a family physician, if you treated a toddler like an adolescent, just because they're all pediatric patients, you would have lost your license. Well, now we know that you cannot treat patients that have physiologic reserve the same as those that don't. You can't treat preterminal patients as a younger and healthier geriatric patients because they do not have the same physiology and they don't have the same psychosocial needs. It is that point right there that distinguishes our knowledge base. Because we talked about this before, that there is very little research on this group over here off to the right. In fact, an article published in PLOS looking at 26,000 randomized control trials. So that only 0.1% of them were dedicated to people over the age of 75, and only 2% were dedicated to people over the age of 65. We deliberately excluded people over the age of 70, 75, people with multiple comorbidities, people with cognitive decline, people with functional decline, and people with institutionalization because they would skew the results for the body of the patient population that we treat. We extrapolated those results back upon this demographic, assuming that it would be equally applicable. And what we're learning is that is absolutely not true. This patient can easily be identified as a preterminal patient using your prognostic skills, some of which you've developed today. And this is the advanced geriatric population. If you ever hear that phrase, this is the group they're talking about. This is where research needs to improve. And this is where we need to up our game. This is the population that's growing the fastest. And this particular patient fell into that category. And unfortunately, this was from a while ago. So they didn't receive the state-of-the-art care that they could have by an updated system. So how do we identify that this patient's a preterminal patient? You look at weight loss. We know this patient's lost weight. And we know that uh, this patient with involuntary weight loss has about a 28% chance of demise within the next two years. That, excuse me. The patient has a heel ulcer. This was a stage three heel ulcer. And incident heel ulcers have high probability of mortality. And this patient's hip fracture was the year before. And even if it's healed, there's still a 70% mortality at one year. And I wouldn't be too comfortable even if they did survive because the fact that you can develop a heel ulcer is talking about the patient's internal physiology. You could not develop a heel ulcer if I had you rubbing your foot this entire CME. The ability to develop a heel ulcer for a person who's lying in bed or has minimal ambulation is very difficult unless you have extremely poor internal physiology. Even a stage one or two heel ulcer has a 55% mortality at, at, uh, uh, one year, and a three or four is 70 percent. Let's say you take all heel ulcers at 68 percent at one year if you don't do any intervention. Even if you do have intervention, it only drops down nine percent. And again, the reason it only drops down nine percent, it's because the internal physiology hasn't changed. The patient remains at risk. 
This patient's had delirium. We talked about that extensively. So you know that the mortality rate for this patient ranges um, from about 30% at three months to almost 80% at three years. And there is research looking at biomarkers, some older research before we had the advent of statins, but I used to take care of patients in nursing homes. And you could look for this triad, low cholesterol, low hemoglobin, low albumin. This patient has all three. And that mortality rate for a nursing home patient or nursing home equivalent, this is a nursing home equivalent, was 84% at one year compared to 7% if they had none of those. What's that look like? weight loss, delirium, heel ulcer, biomarkers. This patient exists on the left side of this graph somewhere between a very short period of time, maybe even weeks to months, maybe a year or two at best. And when I give this presentation to a live audience, I always ask them, how many of you would have been able to qualify this patient for hospice? And a few people raised their hands. They have the knowledge base to know what they're looking for to see that this patient was high risk. This patient, by the way, is not the same patient as this patient. So the one with the four curves and one with no curves, no prognostic markers have to be treated differently. And if you're not looking for those warning signs, you may send a patient to surgery who will have a negative outcome or withhold a patient from surgery that would benefit from that. So we know that we need to start thinking differently about the prognostic warnings that our patients are providing to us. So there's other risk factors in this patient you can look at. This patient has cognitive decline. That matters because you can accelerate that patient's cognitive decline. Depression is associated with a 60% increase in mortality in some cardiac research articles. Social isolation, highly associated with poor outcomes. A lot of people forget how significant social isolation can be in mortality in our patients. And people may say, well, they're living with the son and daughter-in-law, but the patient's alone most of that day, living on her own, that is still socially isolated. And polypharmacy, in fact, there's probably a few other um, prognostic markers, but you can start to look at these things and add them to your armamentarium on prognosticating risk. So the question, of course, then becomes, what's this patient's biggest concern? Whether it's from the perspective of the patient or from healthcare providers or anybody else. My perspective is this patient's going to get overtreated by traditional treatment models. The other question is how much does this patient's cardiac condition actually play into her health status? Or is there something else going on? And I'll tell you the punchline, as you've already learned by taking this course, is that the patient has a geriatric syndrome. You may very well be able to fix the patient's aortic stenosis um, or their coronary artery antrenal issues, but you are going to accelerate their geriatric syndromes, and you're going to possibly make them worse. The last question, of course, is do providers want to know what stage of advanced age their patient belongs to? And that was a question brought up appropriately in Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. Do we want to know what's going on so that we can decide what the appropriate treatment is, or do we just want to treat the organ system and be done with it? So the next question you have to ask is, this patient's risk of developing hospital-induced delirium is, I think most people should know the answer now that they took this course. And the answer is, you could look at this prognostic model. This patient has cognitive decline, visual decline, functional impairment, high comorbidities. You don't have to wait till the patient's in the hospital. High risk of hospital-induced delirium, 63%. And if they do go to the hospital and get discharged, 64% of death or nursing home placement by the end of the year. You can use another prognostic model. There's many. So I'm showing you another one. Just put a model in your pocket, one that works for you. Remember the risk factors um, and then kind of uh, work around that as you see patients to say, well, yes, this patient's a little bit more concerning to me. You have some additional concerns. So please remember a delirium model. There's multiple risk factors for delirium. This happens to be a list of risk factors for post-operative delirium. However, these are the same risk factors as hospital-induced delirium. Our patients are living longer. We already know it's the susceptibility of the patient. The patients are getting much more susceptible than they were in the past. And um, you can use this for hospitalization or for a pre-surgical evaluation. 
To take it to an even higher level, you can recognize that all risk factors are not equal. Um, cognitive decline is more important than age in some studies. Uh, poor vision and hearing is less important than uh, severe illness um, or infections. You can also look at certain procedures. Any aortic procedure, any orthopedic procedure is particularly bad for patients. And by the way, I point out when you do preoperative laboratories, which I know we don't like to use on our younger and healthier patients, but for our older patients, it can prognosticate risk for delirium. I encourage you to be doing an albumin and a BNP um, and other appropriate laboratories according to the disease process. I remind you that age matters. This patient would have been taken to had they done a angiogram to find out that the patient had coronary artery disease for some type of a process that was likely to put them into the ICU. Well, you can talk about treatment options by knowing that you want to avoid the ICU because at the age of actually was 92, this patient's almost guaranteed to have hospital-induced delirium, even at the age of 86 when I lowered the age in the example. So that's a decision tree, a decision point that has to occur with the family and the providers as to whether the patient's going to have surgery um, or whether they're going to have an intervention or whether we're just going to treat it medically. Remember that important risk factors for delirium when you're evaluating uh, uh, your patient is that all patients' risk factors are not equal. So know the important ones. And anybody that ends up in the ICU, especially as they get older, is highly likely to develop delirium. And you have to take that unintended consequences into account when you're giving them recommendations. It's important to recognize you might develop delirium because delirium is associated with all of the following long-term consequences, except number one, delirium is only associated with short-term but not long-term consequences. Delirium is associated with higher mortality, longer lengths of stay, higher rates of readmission, permanent cognitive and functional decline, and higher rates of institutionalization. And you all know that the uh, correct um, response is one, because that's incorrect. Now, I was trained in the 80s. I was taught that delirium was an acute problem with no long-term consequences. Unfortunately, this patient's cardiothoracic surgeons told the patient and family, you're likely to develop delirium but it will almost certainly go away. That is not true. And so we have to be very careful what we're telling to our patients now when they go for a procedure that can put them at risk. I remind you of what happened in particular with this patient. This patient had delirium um, and was significantly higher risk, 500% increased risk of developing, uh, of dying within six months compared to age match controls. And these are those research articles talking about that prognostic risk of mortality. So I remind people that mortality with hospital-induced delirium is about 30% at three months, going to 80% at three years. And please go back and review the delirium presentations if you have uh, any concerns about um, all of the issues surrounding hospital-induced delirium. I want to show you that it's not just the elderly, and a lot of people don't know this. This is an article published in 2012. This was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was for persons age 60 and older. And it showed a statistically significant decrease in MMSE scores 12 months after surgery for patients with open coronary artery bypass grafting and open valve replacement. And that was statistically significant over controls. If the patient was uh, not delirious, it was one out of five, 20%. If they were delirious, it was almost a third of patients. So I don't know how many physicians are telling their patients at the age of 60 when they go for coronary artery bypass grafting that there is a chance they'll have clinically significant cognitive damage. But that's something we need to be thinking about, not only because we need to know about it and guide our patients whether they want to have the procedure or not, but also because there are things we should be doing to protect them if they do decide to move forward. We talked about the fact that delirium can be the precursor for dementia. This again is a study looking at that. After orthopedic procedures, patients that develop delirium, 10 and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with dementia in the next five years. A meta-analysis shows that it was 12.52 uh, uh, times in four years. That was published in JAMA in 2010. And these are some of the original research articles looking at delirium and the consequences of delirium to cognition 
Now, there are now hundreds of research articles showing that these were some of the original articles. That's the progression. And what would you, how would you explain that to this patient? You're likely to develop delirium. It may get better, but over time, it's likely to return. And that's um, uh, the specific diagnoses of del um, delirium, the components of delirium. It's memory that tends to be the worst, but inattention, disorganized thinking, disor uh, disorientation. By the way, the top line is executive function. So if a patient has delirium, you should expect that they're not going to be able to follow your directions very well, and you need to have a better plan of care on how you're gonna be sure that that patient manages a complex illness at home. If they can't do that, it's gonna be very difficult to keep that patient out of the hospital. So if you only have one protocol for discharging patients, I would encourage a second protocol for patients who have delirium. I give this presentation to many providers, executives, physicians, I'm just going to show you that mortality rate is very high. Patients get to hear this presentation. And I want them to know the risks of institutionalization are extremely high. Readmission, hospitals care about that. So it's all higher at one year, people are at risk. I am accused of not talking about the functional decline associated with delirium enough, so I put this in here just to remind people that functional decline also occurs with patients who develop hospital-induced delirium, and if they have delirium in the hospital or you pick it up in the outpatient arena, you could tell them there's going to be a significant chance they will have functional decline, even if you fix the problem for which they went to the hospital perfectly. So a reminder what patients care about. This is from uh, Terry Freed, 75% uh, chance, uh, 75 and about 90% of patients would forego an intervention if there was a significant chance of uh, functional or cognitive decline, whereas uh, about 100% of patients, almost 100% would accept the procedure if there was no risk and mortality was not the most significant issue. I want to reinforce that. This is a different pre, uh, research article. It looked at women age 75 and older and asked them, if you were sitting at home and you fell and broke your hip and we could fix your hip perfectly, but you would end up in institution, what would you prefer, death or institutionalization? And 80% of women said they would rather die. Now, I realize it's a research article. But what our patients are telling us, it's not about survival at all costs. It is about survival with quality of life. And we have to continue to remind ourselves to put the quality of life equations, cognition and functional ability, the ability to go back to the place of residence into the equation of recommendations that we make. So this patient has an anticholinergic burden score of, question number three, 0369 greater than 12. Dr. Hofer, what's an anticholinergic burden score and why do we care? The reason we care is because anticholinergic medications are associated with multiple negative outcomes. The most concerning issue is delirium. Now, polypharmacy trumps um, anticholinergic medications, but of medications, anticholinergic medications are the most likely to predispose a patient to delirium and all of the negative side effects associated with these meds. The most important medication issues associated with hospital-induced delirium, polypharmacy and anticholinergic medications. If you get that as a board question, there's your answer. So let's take a look at this patient's medication list. And I'm gonna walk through all of the problems with this list, not just the ones related to delirium. But you look at um, patients on aspirin, atorvastatin, metoprolol, all of these meds. Let's just calculate the ACB score. So metoprolol gets a score of one, DIG gets a score of one, uh, allopurinol one, furosemide one, oxybutynin three, Paxil two, some give it three, uh, flexoril gets two, hydrocodone gets one, and Tylenol PM gets three. This patient has an ACB score of about 14. Uh, it just depends on the research article. So somewhere between you know, 12 and 15. Regardless, anything over three is considered clinically significant. If a patient had come to my community-based palliative medicine program, this is what their medication list would have been turned into. Nitroglycerin, metoprolol, lisinopril, Tylenol or hydrocodone around the clock, not PRN, 
and they could have PRN medicine in between their daily dose of medication. So we'd start with Tylenol and see if that worked. We would consider using aspirin, um, but probably we would stop that or decrease the medication. Uh, allopurinol uh, would go away because uh, they've lost weight and we'd be stopping their furosemide. Let me go back and take a look at that. So if you look at these medications and take all the medicines, not just the anticholinergic medicines, we now know that aspirin is not a necessary medicine for many patients. The patient had coronary artery disease, so we'd probably keep her on 81 milligrams. Not entirely sure we do that, and we'll talk about that in a second. Atorvastatin is a, of equivocal benefit. Randomized control trial I'll show you about, so we would stop that medication even for secondary prevention at this point in their life. Uh, digoxin. Beer's criteria, it's the wrong dose, but the patient's heart rate was low, so we'd probably stop that one completely. They're already on the metoprolol. Clinical guidelines for the advanced elderly is that her hemoglobin A1C is too low at this age. It should be seven to seven and a half, maybe even seven to eight. Some would even say higher. So she needs, doesn't need to be on metformin any longer. Allopurinol, we'd stop because she's lost weight. We're gonna stop her furosemide because her blood pressure is so low. The Aricept, I'm not entirely convinced she's demented. She may have um, medication-induced cognitive decline, cognitive damage. And that's unfortunate because we could stop many of her medications. Um, oxybutynin, to me, that's what pull-ups are for. Um, to me, I never use this medication except rarely when people use it as needed to go out uh, for meals or on special occasions. If you're gonna keep the patient on Paxil, you change her to a different SSRI. And I would even consider stopping the Paxil because I'm not convinced the patient would necessarily be depressed. She might have had persistent hypoactive delirium, so I would start from scratch. Flexural, another medication, makes them groggy, makes them fall, anticholinergic side effects. We already talked about pain medicine. Ibuprofen with Paxil increases her risk of an upper GI bleed. With the aspirin, makes it incredibly high risk. With potassium ER, immediate, uh, immediate release, that um, four medications increase her risk of bleeding. Uh, Tylenol PM is contraindicated because of the PM, that's diphenhydramine. Patients take these medicines all the time. Multivitamins have been shown to be of no benefit in the advanced elderly. And she's probably on um, pantoprazole because she's on all these medicines that are irritating her stomach and causing um, her, her risk of bleeding. So that's how you get to this list of medications using medical evidence. Let me show you some of that other research. So we talked about the anticholinergic burden score. Uh, this was a study by Amy Abernathy and her team. They took 381 patients. They went to providers and said, do you think this patient's in the last year or so of their life? Um, half of these patients were cancer patients, half were non-cancer patients that were randomized to staying on their statin or not. One of the rare randomized control trials we get in the advanced elderly. And what did we find? That when the patient stopped their statin, they lived 39 days longer. That trended towards clinical significance, did not quite reach it. There, were not a, uh, there was not an increased risk in cardiovascular events. There was a statistically significant improvement in quality of life when patients stopped their staff. So it's the side effects, apparently, the cost, the taking another pill, all those things improved when patients stopped their staffs. And we already talked about the fact patients with low cholesterols um, have a higher mortality rate. We don't know whether that's from the inflammatory suppression or the direct suppression of cholesterol with statins. What we do know in studies where we take statins out of cell membranes and we reintroduce them at normal or lower levels, so lower level, level cell membrane cholesterol levels, the patient's cells ruptures more easily. And we know that low level um, cholesterol patients have more uh, pressure ulcers, deeper ulcers, and wider pressure ulcers. What about the side effects of SSRIs? SSRIs in combination with non are extremely dangerous, a 1,500% increased risk in um, and upper GI bleeds. SSRIs in the first year of use um, increase the risk of falls and fractures. In fact, it's higher than glucocorticoids or PPIs. A lot of people don't know that. Um, yeah, upper GI bleeds go up, post-surgical bleeding, intracranial hemorrhages, patients with SSRIs in the advanced elderly in particular, you can have electrolyte imbalances. If you use too much of the certain SSRIs, you can have cardiovascular events. 
I remind people that to look up the clinical guidelines. Uh, the American Geriatric Society, American College of Cardiology, multiple endocrine societies are telling us that we are having too tight of control of our patients when they're becoming older and managing their diabetes because of the 250% um, rate of increase in myocardial infarctions with hypoglycemia and the ADR, the uh, adverse drug reaction um, of hypoglycemia, increasing the rates of hospitalization by 700%. And I would say that there probably will be in the next few years even better evidence about letting blood pressure and cholesterol rise a little bit when patients get older. We don't know exactly where that is. And I think when people are thinking about this problem, they're thinking about that healthy older person. Palliative and hospice people are thinking about it when they're coming from the end of life. When, when should I have stopped the statin or let the blood pressure rise? So somewhere in between the STAR-E trial is coming out and hopefully we'll have better um, evidence regarding those two issues. I want to point out uh, this slide. This is, we don't get a lot of slides for the advanced elderly. These are patients aged uh, 75 to 80 on the left, 80 to 85 on the right, um, zero to five drugs on the top, 10 or more drugs on the bottom. You can see at the end of a five year window, how many more deaths there are, um, 32 to about 42 on the right graph just showing that polypharmacy is associated with a much higher mortality rate. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, well, of course they're on more meds because they have more problems, but I just showed you how you can demedicate these patients. So it is partially true that they are on more medicines because they have more problems. And it is also partially true that we're over-medicating these patients and we may actually be responsible for some of the morbidity and mort mortality in our patients because we're not de-intensifying care according to clinical guidelines and VIRS criteria. Next question. This patient's um, prognostic risk of developing hospital-induced functional decline is, And this is a rough prognostic model. We can prognosticate for functional decline. This was done by Mark Sager. There are more specific functional decline models. Um, uh, Dr. Robinson has put some of those out. But if you want a basic model that you, it's a little bit rough, but you can stick it in your pocket, older age, decreased cognition, eye ADL deficiency. This patient has all three. That's the scoring tool. And this patient has about a 55 56% chance of developing some level of functional decline, even if we fix the problem, they went into the hospital perfectly. Now, I can't tell you if that's going to be an increase in their timed up and go test. I cannot tell you whether that's going to be uh, urinary incontinence. I can't tell you uh, whether they're going to have uh, uh, difficulty putting clothes on now. What I can tell you is that some form of functional decline will occur in most of these patients, and you could have told them there's about a 50-50 chance you're going to and develop some additional functional decline every time you use the hospital. This patient has how many characteristics of geriatric frailty syndrome? And how many of you picked that out when I gave you that uh, HMP? I wrote all of the characteristics in that patient's HMP so people would immediately know that that patient was a frail patient. And why do we care? So everybody should get this question right. It was five out of five characteristics. This patient had lost her strength. This patient had a 10% um, decrease in body weight, 10 pounds, a decreased activity level, poor endurance. They weren't getting out anymore. They would get tired when they did so, and they were walking and performing more slowly. Five out of five characteristics. I remind you that you can predict surgical outcomes. We know this patient's gonna be in the hospital twice as long losing 5% of their muscle strength per day. In fact, the actual patient was in the hospital for two weeks. So think of what that did to the patient. Surgical complications um, increased. This patient had significant surgical complications. Even minor procedures discharged to an institution, 17%. Major procedures, 42%. This is why I picked this uh, patient up in the nursing home as one of my colleagues' patients. This was almost guaranteed for this patient. This patient was going to be institutionalized. This patient's risk of hospital-associated disability is 53, 63, 73, 83. What is hospital-associated disability and why should we care? So hospital-associated disability is defined as a loss of one ADL needed to live independently without assistance. 
some people would say any loss of ADLs or loss of ability to live independently. It occurs in about 30% of patients over the age of 70. Frail patients are at much higher risk. It occurs even if the illness is successfully treated and has no direct relationship to the illness. I can't say that enough. It occurs even if the illness is successfully treated and has no direct relationship to the illness. This is a geriatric syndrome. I'm reading this right out of the research article that I quoted before, because less than 50% of these patients with hospital-associated disability have recovered to their pre-illness levels at one year. And that's a true comment, but it's not exactly the whole story, because if you look at the research article, 41% of those patients died within one year. Of the remaining survivors, most of those patients did not return to their pre-functional level. Can you prognosticate for hospital-associated disability? The answer is absolutely. Patient has a, they, we don't call those decubitus ulcers anymore. We call them pressure ulcers. This patient had one. Cognitive impairment, functional impairment, low social activity. This patient had four out of four prognostic signs. If you look at the scoring table, three out of four, three or four risk factors. This patient has a 83% chance of developing a condition that has a mortality rate of 41% at one year. Another prognostic marker this patient's going to do poorly. I remind people that the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program has now repeatedly asked us in our preoperative evaluations, 2012, 2016, 2020, to follow the guidelines of doing a mini-cog and an MMSC at least on patients age 70 or older, even if it's just the intervention. They've also asked us to do a frailty evaluation on every single patient 70 years of age or older. People always tell me, well, it takes so long to do an MMSE. If you memorize the MMSE, I encourage people to do it, it takes somewhere between five and eight minutes. Frailty, most of the time, if they're your patient, you'll know that they're frail ahead of time. And doing that evaluation, if you don't know, takes about five to, five to eight minutes again. But it can mean the difference between an outcome that is devastating to the patient or family or a good outcome. So when we do palliative perioperative evaluations, this is the least that we do. And it's recommended by the ACS that we do a timed up and go test. That's where you sit in a chair, you walk three meters, about 10 feet, you turn around and sit down. The original scoring for the timed up and go test was 10 seconds or less is normal, 10 to 20 is borderline, and above 20, you have a positive test. The American College of Surgeons wants to make it easy. Anything above 15 seconds is considered a positive test. You need to be concerned that they will be um, having some sort of form of functional decline or institutionalization after their procedure. Do an MMSC, anything less than 25, consider a referral either back to the primary care physician or a trained palliative provider, anybody with alcohol or drug use, polypharmacy, ACB score greater than three, so you can help to demedicate these patients, multiple comorbidities, age, ADL or IADL dys dysfunction, all of these issues should trigger a reevaluation by their primary care physician or a palliative consultation. So the benefits, um, of doing this is you can anticipate the unintended consequences of care. I actually personally encourage that I would hope the healthcare industry at some point will substitute the annual physical with a general palliative evaluation. It would be a value with our aging population every three years, every five years to do a comprehensive general palliative evaluation. So if the patient does end up in the hospital, we know what their baseline was at some point we have a starting point to evaluate any change and evaluate risk, even if we can't do it as well once the patient's in the hospital. You can also use this in the outpatient arena to guide your patients in decision-making before events occur. And these are the multiple benefits um, by doing that evaluation. I would encourage people to start developing some of these tools um, and using them when you see your patients. You don't have to be a palliative provider to do a more comprehensive event, uh, exam but basic evaluation should be a part of every primary care physician, family physician's toolkit. Doesn't matter. In fact, uh, this is a research article, uh, multi-institute uh, research um, from JAMA. They asked palliative trained physicians to do preoperative evaluations on pre-surgical patients that had come to the hospital. 
And whether the patient went to surgery or not, when they had a palliative consultation, they had a 33% reduction in mortality at six months. That's a third. Imagine a pill that could reduce mortality at six months. This is just having knowledge. What I didn't tell you in this, uh, show you in this slide is the number of patients that refused surgery went from 5.7 up to 19.6 once they were given full disclosure about the consequences of their care. And those patients that moved forward were provided better options in managing their disease and managing their symptoms and protecting them from the unintended consequences of care. So this is from the American um, Heart Association. And um, I hope you have time to read through this, but this is what cardiologists and primary care physicians are theoretically supposed to be doing every single year when they see their heart failure patients. I just wanna read uh, numbers seven, eight, and nine. And seven is discussion should include outcomes beyond sur um, survival, including major adverse events, symptom burden, functional limitations, loss of independence, quality of life, and obligations for caregivers. As the end of life is anticipated, clinicians should take responsibility for initiating the development of a comprehensive plan for end of life care consistent with the patient's values, that is the patient's values, preferences and goals, assessing and integrating emotional readiness of the patient and family is vital to effective communication. Now, I know we would all do that if we had time. I would encourage people to do that for all diseases. If you don't have time, if you have palliative providers or palliative trained providers, that's what they're there for and they can help you out. Some of my favorite palliative slides don't come from palliative medicine. This is um, out of the journal circulation. This is for uh, heart disease patients. This is moving forward in healthcare. What's the outcome that's most important? The outcomes that are relevant to the individual patient. What's the, what's the one problem with this Venn diagram? is that the survival circle should actually be smaller. And that quality of life circle should be much bigger because those are the issues most concern, concerning to our patients. They are uh, repeatedly telling us in research and in, in personal experience, and many physicians will tell you that it's quality of life over longevity um, as patients approach the end of life. That's probably not the case for younger and healthier patients or for older patients, it's actually the case. And in fact, uh, cost and burden, I applaud the American Heart Association because it is well documented that heart failure will bankrupt many of our families because it is such an expensive disease. So it's not enough to leave the cost equation out. We like to do that, but as we're learning with COVID-19, it's not enough just to treat the disease when people are not making an income and they can't take care of themselves and they have financial burden that's making them hard, hard for them to exist. Um, so that's part of the equation. So moving forward, what do we need to do? We need to balance patient-centered quality, quality metrics, PCQMs, with outcomes-sensitive disease um, concerns. And not that we abandon the care that we provide with the traditional metrics, but we have to look at patient-centered care. So organ system-directed interventions, incredibly valuable. But patient-centered quality metrics, when patients have geriatric syndromes, you cannot make the organ syndrome outcomes better if a patient has the geriatric syndrome without making the patient-centered quality metrics worse. You just can't have both at the same time. That's what we're learning. So as our patients get older, remember, it's the susceptibility of the patient. It's not based on chronologic age, it's based on biologic age. So you have to do an evaluation. This is the severity of the insult. So even minor insults, cataract surgeries, hospitalizations, medications, certainly major surgeries can have unintended consequences that patients wish we had warned them about. So I wanna tell you what happened with this patient. So the patient uh, was in the emergency room. Um, the doctors were excited to see there was something to treat. I believe they were trying to do the best they could by telling them that and the family that the patient would develop delirium, um, but he would be re rehabilitated back to his previous level of function. That was just not true. If I was trying to defend a physician in a court of law at this point, I couldn't do it. There's no evidence to support that. 
the patient went for an open valve replacement and coronary artery bypass grafting, he ended up in the hospital for two weeks. He had about a week in the ICU. He had a horribly bumpy course in the hospital. He ended up in the nursing home and he was wheelchair back. He was a two-person assist from his wheelchair to his bed. And he didn't, didn't recognize a single family family member. He spent four, four months in the nursing home while we were trying to rehabilitate him back to his normal care, for which the family was so distraught they finally took him home and said, enough of this. But I, to this day, I remember that son saying, why didn't anybody warn us? If my father had only been warned, we never would have chosen this pathway. So it's time to start warning our patients. We own the long-term out outcomes of our patients and we own the unintended consequences. It's unfortunate in siloed care, we don't follow our patients the way we used to to see those unintended consequences. But I would encourage people to be aware of the consequences of your care moving forward. So thank you very much. There's a new paradigm in care. Uh, we can all do a better job and I appreciate you and I hope you all enjoyed this course regarding geropilative management.